Um, some other challenges uh, that we see in, in technology and some of the advancements in technology is um, Splunk is a fantastic program and it's a fantastic data analytics engine. You know, for us, you know, some of the, the advantages of Splunk is it gives you tremendous visibility, but you have to kind of build in that visibility to your business context. You have to build in, you know, searches. You have to build in workflow. Um, there's some really cool tools that are available out there. You have to have people that understand how to use those tools. Sometimes they're tough to find. And it's not just a point in time. It's not a project. It's a continuous operation. We found that all the time. We'll bring in, or we used to bring in, professionals, hey, set this up for us and we'll be able to run it. Not really, because you always have to adapt the playbooks, you have to create scripts, you have to do a lot of things, and then for us, we have to adapt it to each individual business context. If it's not business context related, then it's just another event that people have to figure out what to do about. So some of the recommendations, and when I get done with a few more slides so we don't have death by PowerPoint, we'll open it up to Q&A as well. Uh, some of the recommendations are related to threat information. So one of the things that we look at and has been very helpful for us is not to just look at a use case from a data source perspective. That was kind of generation one. We said, hey, I've got this list of my data sources, you know, perimeter firewall, IDS, WAF, you know, whatever, web server. Uh, then I've got, you know, all these other data sources that are across the core. And then I've got the endpoint. And then I've got some cloud data sources. What we looked at is threat models. So when you start to build out use cases that are effective, you look at a threat model that will look at you know, the tactics, the techniques that an attacker will use, and the procedures they use to actually propagate through your information and your network to get the data. And so when you build a detection mechanism, you shouldn't be looking at a single event, but you should be looking at multiple events in sequence. And think of your use cases in that model. It's been very helpful for us. The other model that has been helpful for us is understanding how, once you find an event, how do you do that investigation in that search on the back end? And so tying together in, how do I do the search? You know, there's you know, ways to do some of these things with some SOAR technology so that you can bring in you know, virus toll and all these things for your analysts to be more effective. But then how do you actually tie that into a link that you know, gives somebody else the ability to do something at stage two? So in most security operation centers, well, most of them you know, just have a handful of people. They're doing tier one through tier three. Uh, as you build up the, the larger size of a security operation center, you'll have tier one people doing the monitoring, first validation, first investigation. Then it'll go to a security engineer, do a deeper dive into you know, what happened. And then you'll have threat hunters you know, that are looking for the things that do not turn over you know, in a use case or an indicator. You know, they're looking for the anomalies you know, through the visibility of screens that you set up. So use cases are great. Dashboards are, are better for threat hunting. And then machine learning's looking for the things out in the wild that are you know, never been seen that builds up a new indicator. <clears throat> One of the things that we go in and we have a, it's, it's difficult for us to do as an outside provider, and we can see that it's difficult for companies to do on their own, is to provide that categorization of assets. And so, you know, by that, it's, it's not related truly to data models, but we'll go in and we'll say, um, everybody's interested in, you know, PII. Healthcare is interested in PHI. Everybody's interested in you know, GDPR, a lot of people are interested in, you know, some type of, you know, privacy. Where is it? You know, where is my PHI? What are my medical devices? What are my critical devices? What are my non-critical devices? Who are my privileged users? Who are my administrators? Who's going to get the email, you know, that says, hey, you know, can you do a funds transfer? So being able to create a business contextual model so that you can categorize assets, create some type of asset, you know, mapping or zone mapping, and then create some type of privileged user mapping helps you in doing quicker response. Because the faster you can respond, the less you have to do investigation down the train because the attack is going to propagate. So if I know these are, you know, critical devices in a critical zone, then I can quarantine those off. I can begin to look at micro-segmentation and segmenting off certain networks, which we see happening in manufacturing when all of a sudden you've got old NT machines that still get configure on them, you can't upgrade the machine, so you've got to segment them. And so we see that understanding your asset models, your zone models, your privileged user models, allows you to start looking at anomalies in a different way. 
You can say, hey, do I use Tor in my environment? Absolutely not, except these two administrators over here, they kind of use it. You know, um, never, but sometimes probably, you know, people in the room are using it. Um, you know, who's allowed remote access? Who's allowed to get in from a VPN? How do we create anomalies and baselines? Baselines are not machine learning, but they're very helpful. But I got to create, you know, models of people and policy and process so that I can begin to build use cases and tune my use cases around those things. So it's one of the steps that is very helpful as you begin to go down the triage and response path. How many people actually do asset categorization? OK, so there's actually a few. Not complete? How hard was it? Very hard, absolutely. It's one of the things where I mean, we ask and people are like, I don't have it. I don't know if I can get there. There's ways you can set up to do you know, mapping and baselining. You can actually pull some of your privileged users out of your domain controllers, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, what are some of the other recommendations? Hiring, hiring, that's, I mean, if I look at you know, my challenges, it's like sometimes I can figure out the technology challenges. You know, I can just keep beating my head into the wall and, and figure new things out that we've done wrong and fix them. Uh, you know, at different places. The best place to learn is by coming to these types of events and talking to people one-on-one -on -one about what they did. Uh, but the challenge that's really hard is hiring people and keeping those people. There's just a not, not enough out there. So where have we gone? So we're in San Diego, so we get veterans all the time. We actually have a program where we teach military personnel before they come out of service and their spouses about security. And then they go out into the security market. We have internships, and we bring them in as well. We go to universities. Universities now have security programs. They have masters in security programs. Go teach at those things. We have people that go teach classes, and then they help students to learn, and then we bring students in. You know, we put them through our training program. It's like if I can't hire them all, at least they're going out into the community. Help the community. It really helps us all. Um, the other thing is we try and, and hire 50% of the world is women. And we don't have enough women in the high-tech community, in the security community. We try and hire and promote women getting into this field as much as humanly possible. One, they don't procrastinate like most of us guys. Two, they get right to the point. And three, they're very loyal and they don't hop around on jobs a lot. So I, I can't tell you how you know, much we try to do that. Um, the other thing is we're never going to hire enough people. So if you can't populate with people, you've got to automate. Um, and then the question is, you know, can I really get to that autonomous sock? The answer is no. You know, with automation, you're really striving to get 30 to 40 percent, you know, automation through different types of technology. And what we do, one of the best things that we did was we integrated ServiceNow. And so we've got a lot of different components to all the things we do. And we got, you know, a threat intelligence platform. And we got Splunk. And we got Soar. We got automated response. We got all these things. And I can unplug any of them. But at ServiceNow, you know, it's like across all of that. And we took some of our data scientists and we pointed them at the ServiceNow data, and it gave us information about the efficacy of our use cases, which ones were good, which ones were not good. It also allowed us, from our perspective, to look at our clients. And we stack ranked them. Who's our most expensive clients? Who's our least expensive clients? Who's our best? Who's our worst? And it kind of you know, got us to the, to the realization, the best customer for us is the one that engages the alert and does something about it. The worst is somebody that doesn't do anything about it. So we get a repetitive investigation. And then we got to investigate all the way down the stream. So it's almost 10 to 1 if somebody doesn't respond quickly to an event early in the early stage. It's the same for you. If you can respond early in the kill chain you know, or the tactics as they don't spread through their, their techniques, then you're going to be much, much better off in reducing those volumes of, of alerts that you get. Uh, the last thing you know, on, on some recommendations is there are companies like us that are out there in the pavilion that can help you. So if you look at uh, things like, gosh, you know, we're in, in the D.C. area and I can't hire people in D.C., move your sock to Raleigh. You know, move your sock to Kansas City. You know, we're in San Diego. You know, there's a couple of security operations centers in San Diego, and it's a great place for you know, bringing in new talent that we're training. We also realize we can't do 24 by 7 in the US. I can't hire people to work the midnight shift and keep them. So we have security operations centers in Singapore. It's fantastic for us. We went to Barcelona, great tapas and kava, and great people. And so it's been a, a great experience for us. In Singapore, uh, everybody has two years of service. Everybody speaks English as the business language. They're very loyal. They're very dedicated. And they work long hours. And they're pretty sharp. They all have university degrees. Great location for security talent if you haven't investigated that. So look for people that help you to co-manage, to take over some of the resources, help you to get started, or even be your security operations center. Uh, some other recommendations. Um, 
wow, should I go with elastic? Ooh. Should I stick with Splunk? Ooh. You know, so we've looked at both. We've used both in different ways and different shapes and different forms. Um, I got to tell you, Splunk has everything you need. It has an ecosystem and a community and people. Uh, it's a big data analytics engine with the tools on managing big data analytics. Uh, it manages a tool. It thinks about security of the platform itself. Uh, Elastic has a lot of capabilities, but it's not kind of baked yet. And so you've got to have the people in the process to actually manage and build those things on top of it. If you have the team and people that can start to do that, maybe it'll supplement what you're doing in some other areas. But just know that open source is interesting but it, it's not baked fully yet with all the things you need for an enterprise class solution unless you have people that can enable that. Uh, there are some you know, things have, having down, but they don't have the ecosystem that Splunk does. Um, people in process, again, plan for the future. Before you start down the road of implementation and all of a sudden you've got 1,000 notables, figure out, okay, what are some of the use cases I'm going to apply? Where do I get those? How do I modify those? Can I get my asset and zone categorization before I start you know, moving down this path? How am I going to effectively respond? So if I have this investigation for this use case, what's my playbook to say, OK, I need this outside data, that outside data, some threat intelligence over here, and then I need to train somebody on how to work through that model. So look at things like modern attack frameworks and, and how you can do the investigation.